Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Plagemeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Welcome to Cyber Success Stories, a Cybersecurity Career Panel. Um, we wanna thank Palo Alto for Networks for sponsoring today and for making this possible. Um, I'm gonna jump right in because I'm really excited about the topic and about all the people that we're gonna talk with today. We're gonna start with introductions. And I'm going to let all the panelists introduce themselves and tell us in a few minutes each how they got into security and how did they know it was the right field for them. Um, PJ, why don't we start with you? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. I'm PJ. Uh, I'm the Director of Offensive Security at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, and I really got into this field uh, because of the passion I saw in other folks who are part of this field. So I was introduced to cybersecurity um, by a math professor who taught me some basics about cryptography and he loved the topic. And um, I kind of got sucked into that. And I said, I want to, I want to learn more. And so every step of the way since then, uh, it's been the people who I've interacted with and their passion about this, uh, this field and this industry has kind of kept me going. So Neil, how about you? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, the NCA and Palo Alto, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk here. Um, so my, I, I'm, uh, in my current role, I'm, I'm the uh, director of uh, cloud application and platform uh, security at Discover Financial Services. Uh, how did I get into cybersecurity? I started my career in risk. Uh, and when I said risk, right, I was focusing more on the technical technology risk. Uh, and I'm doing like internal audits, external audits, the old uh, SAS 70s, now SOC 1 type, type 1, type 2. So I was looking, I was very familiar with the technology environment and looking at the risk and the business processes and controls. Uh, and then right around that time, I used to work for a big four. Uh, they were kind of starting up their cyber practice, right? So since I was kind of playing in the technology risk area, it was a very natural progression for me uh, into, into, the, into the cyber security area. And since then, I think I have uh, touched all aspects of cybersecurity, except for PJ, maybe the offensive side of cybersecurity, but, uh, but uh, I, I think I've worked in many domains. Zanette? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to say thank you for NCA for inviting us and letting us uh, share this space to talk about an important topic. Uh, my name is Zinette Kamal. I am a wife and a mother of four, uh, and also a recent immigrant from Ethiopia and a career changer into the field of cybersecurity. Uh, I'm also a two times uh, published children's book author. And uh, currently I work at a Fortune 500 company <laughs> at Best Buy as a, an associate cloud security engineer. And prior to that, you know, when I began, like Sunil mentioned, I worked in an IT audit space as well as in information security uh, engineering spaces when I was working at the state government. Um, and what sparked my interest into cybersecurity is, you know, like I mentioned, I had a legal background when I moved to the US. I, I saw this opportunity to study, you know, my long passion of being in technology and, you know, started from community college doing computer, you know, associate degree in computer programming and computer science. And then, you know, during my final years of uh, doing a computer science program, I became part of a CCDC. It's a collegiate cyber defense competition. And, you know, representing the university in that cyber defense competition literally started, sparked my interest uh, into the world of cybersecurity. So I'll just end it that way and then move on to the next person. And then we'll add more as the discussion progress. I'm tired just thinking about four kids writing books and working at the same time. <laughs> Uh, Anthony, you're next. Thanks. Well, uh, to echo everyone else, appreciate you all having us. And uh, hello to everyone out in virtual space who's listening to the words we have. Um, my, my path is uh, a bit different than everyone else's, which is pretty indicative of, of anyone getting into cybersecurity. Uh, I went to school initially to become an engineer. Uh, that didn't work. I ended up getting a degree in education and then a master's degree in business. Uh, so I started my career in product marketing and product management, uh, really at the intersection of uh, education, technology products, global manufacturing, uh, sort of mindset, and security was always sort of tangential to those products, right? Uh, and then, you know, a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to, to become a program manager at a nonprofit, the West Michigan Center for Arts and Technology in Grand Rapids, 
Michigan, where I launched a community-based cyber hub, really focusing on, you know, how do we help grow and diversify the, the cyber talent pipeline in general? And that's really where uh, I got to sort of peel back the curtain to the infosec industry, um, you know, uh, I even sort of picked up, sort of, but I actually did pick up my Security Plus certification. So, um, you know, security awareness uh, and, and all of that stuff. And today I am at um, Grand Circus as an associate director. Where I'm really focusing on, again, helping folks identify and equipping them with the resources to pivot their careers into tech, uh, work for a coding bootcamp training provider. But as we'll talk about later, I'm sure there's, you know, layers of security embedded into anything that's tech sort of tech career centered. So um, I think there was another part of that question, though, Lisa, where where you were asking, like, how did we know that this was the right field for right. us? Um, and and for me, I'll I, I'll go ahead and date myself here. But I grew up, you know, in the 90s where uh, we were starting to get computers in schools, but they were you know, running programs off of floppy disks and, you know, word processing, gener generally speaking, and dot matrix printers uh, in the computer lab. Um, so I've sort of, you know, have always, uh, oh, oh, one other example, uh, summer camps focused on the Microsoft Office suite, right? <laughs> like, I think <laughs> between third and fourth grade. Like that anymore? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, hey, learn how to use this Microsoft PowerPoint thing and slide animations out the wazoo. But um so I, I've always sort of been attached and, and close to tech. Um, so it, it feels sort of like home base to have a, a career in and around security. But uh, also I grew up uh, on a military base as part of a military family. And so, um, you know, whether it's it was intentional or sort of implicit, this, this ethos of helping protect those around you, because at the end of the day, security is security, right? Whether it's it's physical security or it's in a, in a virtual cyberspace, um, you know, that, that so again, that ethos of helping protect individuals, um, you know, is and making sure that we're protecting our infrastructure, but also the people, right? Because at the end of all of the, the, the blinking lights and the keystrokes are humans like all of us on this panel who are affected by that stuff. So um, that's sort of how I, I knew that cybersecurity was right for me. And I'm sure that uh, there's there's a handful of other stories from different life experiences as yeah, well. Yeah, that sense of mission is really common. You hear that from a, from a lot of people and that sense of, of passion that PTA described that she got from her university professor. Um, so uh, Anthony, sticking with you, what kind of tips, you know, you, you described a career path that was not linear, um, uh, nor were most of ours, right? We, we kind of took some zigs and zags to, to get into the jobs that we that we do now. Um, so what kind of advice would you give somebody who's, who's trying to zag, right? Who's decided that they want to pivot into cybersecurity and, um, you know, what's the first tip that you have off of your, off your, off top of your head that you'd give somebody who's trying to make the switch? Yeah, for sure. I mean, aside from my tried and true path of trying to become an engineer and ultimately, uh, launching a cyber hub yourself in case that's not you know necessarily in your wheelhouse. Um, I think the the general advice that I would give uh, is sort of you know three different buckets. One is you know follow podcasts and people, right, and and sort of get a lay of the land of of what's out there, what you like, what you think your interest might be. Um, you know, step two would be connecting to professional networks around cybersecurity. There's there's no shortage of affinity groups and sort of niche areas within infosec. Um, and then three is uh, reach out to free, the, again, those exploratory type resources, right? Workshops, videos, things like that. Um, to give you a few examples of each, because I don't want to just like say that and then not provide any maybe targeted direction. Um, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So, you know, Darknet Diaries, Eighth Layer Insights, um, uh, the Black Cyber Podcast with George McPherson, Social Engineer Podcast, following a lot of folks on LinkedIn, like uh, Naomi Buckwalter, Jason, Josh Mason, Chris Roberts, uh, Lisa, yourself, right? Other other CISOs, um, and uh, in terms of you know resources that are out there, uh, obviously the National Cybersecurity Alliance's Cybersecurity Education and, and Career Resources page is phenomenal, um, and and maybe a subset that of resources that are within that. Uh, you know, uh, Palo Alto has some free resources that are in there. Um, 
There are Cisco Networking Academy courses that you might be able to take for free. Uh, there's the SAN Cyber Aces videos that just provide a great overview. So, you know, sort of those general resources of, you know, really leverage the free things that are out there to help you get a lay of the land um, in terms of what's in InfoSec and, uh, you know, start to figure out what you might be interested in before you invest any, any money or significant amount of time going down a path that you might ultimately decide is not for you. Yes, Leah is showing off our, uh, she's doing her best Vanna White with our with our web webpage that you mentioned. And um, thanks to Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring that as well and allowing us to um, to build that. So what we've done is, is corralled from all over um, the World Wide Web, as we used to call it, um, all the different free education and career, career resources that are out there. And you can sort and filter in various methods, depending where you are in your career. But there's there's just so much stuff out there. When we looked around and said, how can we help, you know, with the um, the gap between the, you know, all the open jobs and the people who want to get into the field, um, rather than create more free resources, we realized that what, what really needed to be done was to amplify the existing resources and make them easy to find. There are a ton of resources out there where the folks that, that have um, developed the resources haven't had the ability or the funding to invest in things like search engine optimization. So when you sit down to Google all these things as somebody who's searching, it can, you know, some of the best stuff may end up on, you know, page five. So we we felt like the best thing to do was to get them all into one place so that they're easy to find. Um, if you're on the other side of this conversation and you actually have free resources to, to that you'd like to see here, then um, just drop us a line at info at staysafeonline.org. Um, and then we have some really interesting stories of people who um, have um, made the career pivot. So there's good stuff out there. Um, speaking of, of Palo Alto, PJ, do you want to talk a little bit about what advice you would give um, to people that want to pivot into the field? Uh, certainly. And, and I saw a couple of questions pop up uh, in, in the chat there. Um, it, it can be overwhelming. I, I think you you put it really well, Lisa, is having a, a page like this is so important because the industry, the field can be overwhelming. Um, my, my suggestion would be, and again, uh, like many on this, uh, or some of you on this panel, I'm also, uh, I've been in this industry for, for some time now. Things have changed quite a bit and evolved quite a bit, um, but, the feeling of kind of that dread and being overwhelmed was still there when I remember uh, when I was first looking for internship, for instance. And it wasn't an easy start. It took me a while to uh, really find an intern position that, uh, that I really liked. And there were a couple of failures. Um, my suggestion would be don't overthink it. Um, I, there, <laughs> we know there's no shortage of uh, opportunity in this in this field, uh, don't try to, well, don't try to overthink it. Um, one thing that is great about cybersecurity field is um, there are constantly a number of challenges, a number of problems that are needing to be solved. Um, and we push for diversity so much because each of those problem requires just a different type of thinking. There's many struggles we have from scalability, uh, from trying to convince our engineers or our uh, administrators to actually pay attention to, to security. So there's so many of these different skill sets, tactics that actually are required to do something well in the security field that it's guaranteed you're gonna find a good fit. Just get started. Um, there's some some very amazing resources linked here uh, or mentioned here uh, by Anthony as well as uh, the page that we just saw. Uh, familiarize yourself and just jump in. I, I'm a big fan of just get started, right? Sometimes a nerve shot is just the, the yeah. hardest part, right? So so staying with you, PJ, um, along those lines, what are the different roles and domains in cybersecurity, right? You mentioned there's so many different things and I think yeah. Lydia's gonna, gonna share her screen with us again as you're talking. Yeah, so uh, this is an excellent res uh, resource, the Cybersecurity Career Guide. And one of the th things it includes is 
uh, based on the NIST cyber workforce framework. Um, it kind of talks about some of the skill sets uh, that the cybersecurity field requires. And the reason we don't talk about roles, I mean, there have been instances uh, that I've come across where we had to create a role um, for a specific sort of problem space that we were uh, trying to deal with. So forget about roles, but think about the, the styles of, of careers you can have, the operational side of things, the analytical side of things. Um, the engineering side of things, there's a lot of automation uh, required these days for cybersecurity, the communication side of things. Anytime there is an incident, anytime we make a policy change, we have to uh, communicate it across uh, our entire enterprise. So we need a comms people. Security uh, awareness that Anthony mentioned, we need to teach people how to do things securely. Um, so there's a lot of need for somebody who is really passionate about teaching uh, technical things. You don't need to necessarily know the uh, the cybersecurity um, concepts per se, but you, if you have the ability or you have the passion uh, to take something technical and translate it or simplify it, uh, cybersecurity awareness and training is a great uh, path uh, as well to pursue. What else? Uh, so analysts, engineers, um, we have just these hackers, really. Uh, there is no one type of uh, personality that fits like an offensive security um, engineer role. Uh, if you're curious, if you love to kind of understand complex things and then find ways you can uh, break it, that's your path. Um, so tons of different uh, opportunities within the field. Uh, but again, yeah, just just try to kind of familiarize yourself, see what calls to you, because you're gonna have you're gonna have certain aptitudes, certain strengths that are unique to you, um, and use that to to kind of get started on the journey. So I think we have a question that came in about the entry level jobs. Um, we can put a link to this this resource in the in the chat if we haven't already and i think it it kind of speaks to those entry level um positions if you flip to page 16 17 leo um there was a question about certification certifications yeah yeah and and i would like to to take that question now instead of waiting till the end because we're kind of talking about you know education and pathways and certifications are, are part of that decision that i think people have to make as they progress um Sanyal, you were you were nodding your head. What's your what's your opinion about how much faith do you put in certifications in this industry? Are they absolutely necessary? Um, what's your uh, what are your thoughts about certifications? Yeah, so like if you're looking for an entry into cyber security career, right? I I would keep certifications secondary. I will focus more on on getting uh, practical knowledge and understanding the threat environment. Uh, certification is important and has its place. And, and when you look at like uh, all the job descriptions, right, like that are posted, right, you see certification all over the place, right? But I would say like, I think P, one thing that uh, PJ said, and I think Lisa, you also emphasized, get started. Don't hold yourself from applying for those positions just because you don't have a certification, right? I have rarely seen in my, my career certification being a deal breaker. Right. Uh, so, so the more the if the first step is to apply and get into the door and get that opportunity to have a conversation. And if you can demonstrate that you understand the threat environment, you you have that attacker mindset. When I say that, right, you think about how the adversary will think, right, and then how how you can build processes and, and controls and and technology to 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 build your defenses around that. I would rather focus on that, right? If you're trying to break into this career, right? Um, and, and at the entry level, like, there are like a lot of different roles and you need to pick a path, right? And I'm, just to simplify it, and I'll, I'll run a football analogy, right? Uh, it's, it's just like football, right? So there is, uh, there is uh, offense, defense, special teams and field operations or support staff, right? So it's, it's very similar in the cyber, uh, cyber world. So you need to pick a path, but don't think that, that that's the path you will stick, right? I think uh, all of us on this call, right, started in, on one path and ended up somewhere else. Right. Uh, so I would say, like, keep an open mind, but but focus on learning and take the first step, go apply. Right. And then I saw some question around why I've spent 15 years in a different technology field. Right. Don't have that kind of stop you from applying. Right. I have seen the best like AppSec engineers that I have 
came from development background because they understood what is the process we are protecting, right? So keep that mindset, uh, open mindset when, when, we, when you are trying to break into this career. Sanat, would you share some thoughts with us as well about uh, educational paths and degrees and certifications? Yeah, <clears throat> so had I known what I know now, being you know relatively newer into the industry, um, three to five years of experience because um, I really you know started full, my full time job at 2018 in IT auditing space before transitioning into information security. So, what I would say is you know research uh, and you know like PJ mentioned, it's a really huge um, industry with different domains, seven to eight domains, and and choose what it speaks to you the most, and then uh, look at those people who are on LinkedIn. Um, and see like um, the kind of role, you know, when I, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of thing, like um, see uh, in a position that you want to be in and see what, what roles are, what certifications are required and what, you know, what job requirements are required, like really research into those roles is also very important. Um, and then when it comes to certification, you know, uh, the way I look at it is I know there is a lot of debate, you know, to cert or not to cert within the industry, but the way I look at it is, you know, it helps me focus on uh, learning in one space when I could be doing a million things, you know, so, um, and then really not only, you know, accumulate those certifications, but make sure that they're serving you in terms of how am I going to utilize them uh, for my short and long term career goals. So I would recommend usually, you know, I started from network class, you know, as soon as, you know, I, I had that participation and know my interest in cybersecurity after I participated in the CCDC competition. I had this, um, I have this um, scholarship to take CompTIA certifications where the course was covered. So on top of doing my undergrad school classes, I was a full-time student, but since I, you know, I found that passion and interest in security, I started from network class and security class in CYSA. And I recommend, you know, security class because it's so foundational. And then once you have that, um, it, it covers a lot of things from foundational perspective. And then you can choose and carve out which route you want to go from there. And if you want to deep, deep dive, you know, you can choose the route of uh, red teaming or, you know, defense or, you know, all of those like compliance. There are so many untapped spaces within the field of cybersecurity. Um, you can explore all of those things. So I don't know if I answered the question correctly. No, you didn't. And I think um, I'll second that. I hear a lot uh, uh, from a lot of practitioners that Security Plus is a really good starting point. There's some there's some Q&A going on in the chat and that, that might answer some of those questions that that's a, a really good starting point. I really like the way, Zanette, you described um, are your certifications serving you? Because it's such a big business. <laughs> So the certification business, don't let anybody fool you. There's 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 a lot of um, there's a lot of revenue in that business. So you do want to get something that is going to be meaningful and is going to serve you. Um, it's not a race to collect alphabet soup, right? It's not a it's not a race just to collect um, certifications. I mean, some of the most talented people I've met in the field had very few certifications, if any. And then I've also met people who had certifications, a list as long as your arm and, and were not exactly, you know, at the top of their game. So it's, it's not a substitute for any of the things you described, those sort of natural inclinations and, and um, really learning, you know, and, and there's nothing in your way of, of getting started, of just experimenting and, and taking advantage of all the free stuff that's out there and trying to figure out what might be right for you. Um, uh, Sunil, can you talk a little bit about what what employers are looking for? Talk, speaking of certifications and unrealistic job descriptions that have 20 certifications listed, we, we at the National Cybersecurity Alliance are working with our PR team to um, possibly edge into the HR publication space a little bit and, and try and get in front of more recruiters and hiring managers so that... Um, or, the, or the HR folks helping those hiring managers so that they're more educated about what you really do need in security. And so they write job descriptions and, and requirements that are a little more realistic. I think there's a lot of uh, disgruntled security people on Twitter talking about job descriptions right. lately. And, and, and so talk to us a little bit about what you're really looking for. You know, let's, let's put aside the issue of, of how some JDs get written um, and talk about um, what, you're, what people are really looking for when they post 
And Lisa, Lisa, I'll just quickly touch up on the, the problem in the industry that you are pointing out, right? And, and that it is a real problem. I think we need to mm -hmm. be better at kind of writing job description that truly describes what they will be doing than what we are looking for, right? I think that, needs, that story needs to flip, right? But, but it will take some time. Uh, as far as kind of as employers, what we are looking for, right? I think I think like one thing that is very important in this field is is the practical knowledge because I look at cybersecurity as a practice. It's it sometimes it's art, right? So how you approach problem solving, I think PJ kind of touched upon that. How you look at what is your view of threats, right? Uh, and how you can apply processes, controls, or, or te technical defenses to address those risks is something that I think we, we are always looking for. Because at the end of the day, right, well, if I look at like what we do as practitioners, we are having discussions with our application development teams, we are having discussions with the business. So we need to be able to understand the threat and translate it to uh, uh, in risk terms, right, and communicate it to the business, communicate to our stakeholders. And you have been a CISO, so you understand, like communicate to the board members, right? So the, the, uh, the more mature or more experienced uh, professionals in this field have that, that art, right? I think, I think that's something that to keep in mind of, like even in early in your career, right? Uh, understand the value of your work and how you kind of are contributing into the big picture, right? I think that understanding is so important. And that is, I, I feel a big differentiator when you are interviewing for a particular job, right? If you can tell that story, I think it will resonate very well with, with your hiring managers. Anybody else want to chime in on that question? What are you looking for when you hire? I can, yeah, I have, I have a lot of strong feelings about uh, about this topic as well. We like strong um, feelings. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I can see why it would be challenging for uh, potential candidates to figure out what exactly it, are they looking for, and that's why the the whole um, topic of just just apply. Uh, because it is difficult for hiring managers to put exactly what they're looking for into a job uh, description. Sometimes you just have to talk to the candidates to know that yes, this, this is this is the the uh, person that that is the right fit for the role. Um, but a lot of times, one of the things about cybersecurity is you you're always going to have a cybersecurity team that is much smaller than. Uh, the engineering teams that are producing the things that cybersecurity teams have to. Uh, protect and defend. That means that a lot of times what we um, really are looking for is somebody, first of all, who has an immense ability to learn new things because it's not a static field. Uh, technology by itself is not a static industry. It, it keeps changing, which means we have to keep adapting to what, what's happening, right? Move the, the transition from on-prem data centers to, to cloud, for instance, is, is a great example of the massive shift in what uh, cybersecurity needed to kind of uh, deal with uh, in recent times. So ability to learn uh, analytical skills, I cannot stress enough, analytical or critical skills. And if you don't exactly know what I mean by that, definitely Google it. Uh, there's some, in, some good resources on uh, developing those skills. But there's a lot of problem solving. There's a lot of just looking at things and trying to make sense of what is going on. Uh, which means that you need to be able to decompose sort of larger problem sets and figure out how you're going to solve them. Uh, so that's uh, that's a key component. And then um, whether you like it or not, big portion of cybersecurity, any cybersecurity role is having to work with others. Uh, you need to be able to build partnerships uh, with a lot of different sets of folks across uh, companies or wherever you are that uh, that you're employed. Um, so things like empathy, uh, ability to build partnerships, those truly become critical uh, as well. And at least for me as a hiring manager, those are the things that I value more than somebody showing me a specific, um, you know, attack tactic or attack technique that are that they are amazing at. Those skills definitely can be taught and can be learned after the fact, but there are certain soft soft skills that we cannot do without. I'm not a hiring manager, uh, <laughs> but I, I have had a number of, of conversations with folks who are, and just to echo what, what Sunil and, and PJ have said, right? Um, 
continually the conversation can comes back to like we can teach people like the hard technical skills it's the it's the creative problem solving it's the insatiable curiosity to understand how things work it's you know uh having humility right knowing that you're not going to know everything being organized uh being a good communicator so what some people call soft skills i prefer to call them power skills right um like those are going to help lengthen your your interest and aptitude for a career in cybersecurity far beyond the 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 technical skill so to speak um so i just wanted to 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 throw that out there as a supplement uh to to all the great things that have been said so far no thanks for that um it looks like we have a, a teacher who wants to know more about sharing uh about cybersecurity with her students and um, and Zanette, we have we're lucky enough to have you on the on the call today. Um, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about your children's books and and also um, why you think it's important to empower young people to learn about cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, so simply put, I would say, you know, uh, they are the next generation. And when I retire, and I mean not retiring here in snowy Minnesota, somewhere sunny, <laughs> uh, I want a more safer cyberspace so that, you know, you know, in order to have that, we need to equip our, you know, younger generation with that mindset and skills uh, of staying safe. And, and operating securely online, you know, with everything being done online now, and that you can imagine in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So I would say, you know, the safety of our world in, in the present and in the future, that's that's one of the reasons why I wrote the children's book, Oh No Hacked Again, you know, inspired by my own children, um, the, exp the experiences of my children um, gaming online, you know, to, um, teach kids, you know, the importance of online safety, as much as we're teaching them, um, you know, how to be careful when you're crossing the street, look left and right, or we're so quick to give them those tablets. I don't think we teach them enough about the importance of, you know, securing their password, that they're not, they're not supposed to be sharing their passwords with anyone, or that's some of the things that are highlighted. And these are all my kids, by the way, including the, sec the two-year-old, which is at the back cover of the book, uh, but the most important thing is also, you know, showing diversity because uh, me being relatively newer into the industry, I quickly learned that cybersecurity isn't a diverse industry. So that was me showing with the characters and family that look like me um, to show that, you know, we do belong in this industries as well. And that, you know, young readers can see themselves in such lucrative industries in science, technology, engineering and maths and specifically cybersecurity. Uh, where where I noticed that racial and gender um, you know lack of diversity in that in that regard. So uh, it's meant to spark interest. We can never tell them which route to go, but you know if they know and I see and if they see someone who's already in that space, I think hopefully they'll be inspired to explore those career options uh, when they grow too. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that uh, the teacher may, might have, uh, but I hopefully I answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I have a, another piece of advice for anybody. I think there was also somebody who was a, a journalist or a writer that had a question earlier when we first started, as well as the um, the teacher. Anybody who's coming at it from, I think, outside the industry or, or isn't technical is more of a soft skilled person, or um, as you said, Anthony, power skilled person. Uh, for me, you know, just just getting steeped in these things. I mean, I, I literally, I was a marketing person and I literally just started reading um, like Brian Krebs's newsletter because he uses a lot of layman's terms to explain complex things um, or the Sans Ouch newsletter, which is written for the end user that gives a lot of good explanations. It comes out monthly, things like that. I've got Nicole Perlroth's book sitting uh, on my kitchen counter, this is how they tell me the world ends. I'm going to dig into that. She was an investigative reporter with the New York Times and writes about cybersecurity. So she's obviously writing for the end consumer. Um, there's there's podcasts out there. There's, oh, there's a couple of really good podcasts about Stuxnet um, and other sort of complex things that are that are really easy to listen to and entertaining even, um, um, especially Stuxnet. That gets pretty <laughs> pretty riveting story when you get into it. So. Um, you know, there's plenty of content out there that um, explains some of the, the technology in ways that even I can understand, if I can understand it, then, then anybody can do it. And I love Zanette's book for kids. Um, and there are um, a few other, I've seen comic books, 
out there about cybersecurity as well that don't get deeply technical that can be really good resources to use to communicate with others. So um, I broke into the field through training and awareness and then doing incident comms and things like that. So if, if you're coming from um, sales, marketing, journalism, teaching, uh, I actually know a teacher who went to then be a journalist writing about cybersecurity. She had been an English high school English teacher. And uh, now she works for one of the big um, conferences in the, in the security space as part of the, the editorial staff that you know, chooses the speakers and lines up the conference. So um, lots of interesting career paths out there. Um, Anthony, in your feature on our um, security education and career resource library on our site, you talk about how expectations and pressures within certain communities can be a barrier to bringing people with different back backgrounds into the world of, of cybersecurity. And, and as Annette said, it's um, it could be a little more diverse than it is. Uh, can you tell us some more about that, please? Yeah. Um, so so it it may come as a shock. <laughs> he says sarcastically that uh, the cybersecurity workforce is not terribly diverse. Uh, so as a quick aside. Uh, I'm super proud of the National Cybersecurity Alliance for the representation of melanin on today's panel. Uh, if we could get the rest of the of the cyber workforce to to look like the the panel, um, you know that would that would be huge because there's just untapped talent pools. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention as an as aside to an earlier question, um, as a you know sort of a brief anecdote, is if you have a uh, a hiring requirement you have to get seven out of 10 questions right to be a part of the team, right? It's possible that you have a team full of people that get the same seven questions right, but then you have a gap, right? Where there's three questions that nobody knows how to answer. And if you're intentionally seeking out uh, folks that have different lived life experiences that might only get three out of seven right, but those are the three that will perfectly complement your team. Um, you know, that sort of goes to ho hopefully show the, the need <laughs> for diversity and, and the tech workforce and cybersecurity specifically. Um, as, as another comparison, right? Like every good bank heist movie has uh, a team with like very niche skills, right? So it's like, you gotta make sure that you're spreading your skills out uh, over a couple of different areas. Um, so so, so I'll, I'll back up. Yes, the workforce is, is overwhelmingly white, it's overwhelmingly male um, and Access is a huge issue. So the national, uh, the the resource library that we were talking about earlier is huge in terms of providing access to resources, but that doesn't necessarily solve your problem if there's a lack of awareness or exposure or excitement or what we might call interest for a career in in tech or cybersecurity, and and even if you have all of those things, right? Access, awareness, excitement, exposure. If you don't have permission, right? Uh, then then it's all sort of comes to a grinding halt. Uh, as, as another anecdote, um, I got my Eagle Scout in 2005. And uh, if you are ever in scouting, there's an age around eighth grade where it becomes incredibly, uh, incredibly unpopular to be in, in scouting of any kind. Um, and so a lot of my friends were leaving and I told my parents like, hey, I don't wanna be in scouting anymore. Uh, they told me, sorry, we already paid your dues for this year. I guess you got to stick it out one more year. And so I did at the end of that year, I said, hey, I don't want to be in scouting anymore. I said, sorry, we paid your dues already. And, uh, you know, long story short, I ultimately ended up getting my Eagle Scout. And I'm very happy that my parents did that. But it's because they were providing, and maybe permission is a little heavy handed, they were forcing me for lack of a better expression, but I'm, I'm happy for that on the back end. Um, but they, they were essentially advocating on my behalf, right? Like, you know, this is a skill set and something that you do enjoy. You're just sort of self selecting out because of peer pressure. And as it relates to tech careers and, and other areas of interest that folks might have, maybe outside of tech, right? If there is not uh, societal permission, or cultural permission within you know communities that you might belong to to pursue those interests, you can have you know the access, the exposure, the excitement, but you won't be able to continue progressing. And so, um, you know, that is a huge barrier from my personal experience, from anecdotal experience, from from other folks who who look like me and might not be represented in tech, as um, you know being able to look at the workforce and identify folks who look like you that you can model after and hopefully follow in their footsteps for. So, um, you know, that, that sort of, you know, 
in some additional words, expands on the story that I was telling on on uh, that that post that you all made, um, and and maybe even tying that back to you know. Uh, maybe we're talking about, you know, misconceptions and things like that. Um, you know, if you're thinking about people, different lived experiences being uh, a great asset to your team, um, you also have to think about what are the barriers to getting people beyond permission uh, in, into those roles. And so, um, you know, if there's an, an entry level or a low paying job that serves as a great uh, splash into tech, right? Maybe careers like help desk where a lot of people in InfoSec get their start there because it's a great cross section. Um, but if there are individuals who aren't able to support their families uh, in those roles, then you have to think about intentionally looking at that as a talent pool, as a barrier that is forcing um, sort of like, is it negative selection? I might be mixing up some terms here, right? But you, people are, are sort of selecting who have the means to go down a certain pathway, which is exclusionary to um, hopefully some of that great diversity that we're missing out on today. AJ, do you have any advice specifically for women who are trying to break into the cybersecurity field? Certainly, uh, having been in that position How much time do we have? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so not just... Uh, breaking into the, the industry, but also kind of just advancing uh, once you're in as well. Uh, two things, one, the first one is, I don't know how popular it is gonna be, but really it comes down to just be the best in whatever you have decided to do. I, the, the corporate culture is such that they are not gonna care much about, um, your background or your gender or anything, as long as you are producing for them what they can sell. Uh, so it really comes down to, that's why we talk about things like passion, passion and, and such things, because really um, that's the core aspect of uh, becoming the best. And being the best is obviously a, a transitionary thing, right? Like you can be the best today and then somebody comes along and you're like, oh man, they are so much better than me. And now you need to kind of up the bar for yourself, right? Uh, but really it comes down to that. Don't worry about anything else, to be honest. Um, set aside your woman, your this ethnic background, like set aside all of that. Feel confident in, in your abilities and be prepared for failure. It took me multiple tries to get an internship the, at Palo Alto Networks when I first, uh, so I was first hired as a principal red team engineer. It took me two tries uh, to, to get that role. Uh, and that was quite later in my career as well. Um, but if you genuinely are interested in something, if, if you feel passionate about it, and if you know you can be the best, um, go for it, forget, forget everything else. Uh, the second thing I would say, and this this is more probably after you enter the field, uh, know who your allies are, uh, and they're going to be many. Uh, I've I've been at few different places, and uh, certainly in the minority for sure uh, as a as a female employee. Uh, but it didn't really matter. I I was lucky enough to have uh, a lot of peers around me, um, gender aside, who really supported me a lot um, whenever I needed it. So know who your allies are, um, know who your detractors are, and just ignore them and uh, get what, what support you need from, from your allies. Yeah, those are, those are super, super points. I would second them. So if, we're, if, if, if you're unpopular, I'm gonna be unpopular with you because, <laughs> because <laughs> I, uh, I completely agree with, with both of those. Um, so Nat, I think you have some metrics about, about diversity in the in the field. Uh, and I think Leah's gonna share her screen again. Do you wanna talk about? Um, yeah, I mean, all of what, PJ, all of what PJ said, um, but I just wanna say, you know, women comprises of 51% of the population. And, you know, this Aspen uh, statistics that I have seen recently, despite the fact that, you know, 51% of women comprise of the whole population only until recently, it was 11% of um, women professionals within the industry were women identify as a woman um, and recently grew up to 24%, which is really lower still. So I would say, you know, uh, adding, adding to the advice 
once, you know, I, I would say that, you know, uh, know that you do belong and find your tribe. There are organizations that are there uh, with the mission of creating awareness and creating that diversity within the industry, such as, you know, Black girls in cyber. Uh, and if you look at the number before you scrolled up, there are 9% of professionals, Black professionals within the industry are um, identify as Black professionals. And if you, if you take that to Black women, and the number goes down. So I think we need to be cognizant of what resource and talent that we're leaving out and how do we address that and supporting those organizations who are supporting, um, you know, this work of like, for example, Empower Cybersecurity. That is one organization that I know that people, you know, to find that confidence and say that, you know, I do belong. I think it's important to find your tribe. Uh, Women in Cybersecurity is another organization, uh, Black Girls in Cyber and Empower. I think those, and then um, I think there are also Black Girls Hack is also another organization that I follow and they're doing really good work of, you know, teaching that and creating that uh, awareness and diversity within the industry through creating resources, scholarships, and a lot of things. And I would like to also shout out to share the mic in cyber, how they're, you know, they're sort of you, having like a, a movement, you know, for highlighting those cyber uh, black cybersecurity professionals within the industry, uh, pairing them with allies uh, to, to showcase their work. So um, I would mention those um, few points. Yeah, we'll put a link to this uh, to this blog from at the Aspen Institute on the in the chat. I think that was written um, by Camille Stewart, a friend of the NCA at Google. She's a, a black woman working in security and privacy, um, and has her has her law degree. And she's fascinating. Another great person to follow on on LinkedIn. Um, Just look at one of the questions that came in here. We'll, we'll start veering a little bit from our script as it was to talk a little bit more about some of these questions. So there was a question early on for somebody who was in law enforcement. And um, it's not unusual to go from law enforcement background, um, whether that's a federal or local law enforcement background working in security, because you, you already sort of have that sense of mission and that desire to want to help people. Um, and my, my, uh, I'll open this up to the panel, but my personal experience in folks that came from a law enforcement background, a lot of them have, um, have come in through either obviously working in the, in the physical security team. Um, if you work at a company that has a converged approach, then you might find yourself all in one department, not a company where this, the physical security folks roll up to HR facilities or, uh, in some administrative function like that. Um, the other thing I've seen is folks that have a law enforcement background can often start in, um, in fraud and fraud detection. And um, just knowing, uh, you know, just having those, those thinking, you know, that approach um, to, uh, to, to the issue of fraud and, and fraud prevention and detection can be really helpful, having that law enforcement background. Um, because you kind of know how to think that way, <laughs> to think like a bad guy, that's helpful. Um, but panelists, do you have any other, any thoughts on if you were coming from a law enforcement background and you weren't technical and you, you wanted to get into the field? I mean, I, I think about fraud because so much of it now uh, has a cyber component to it that, it that it didn't used to. And that can often be um, kind of a, a gateway drug to getting into the rest of security. Um, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mentioned it in the chat. I think threat intelligence is probably another domain uh, that you might really like. Um, so it might be worth checking in. And uh, um, again, it's it's quite a diverse field as well. So we, I mean, Palo Alto Networks has uh, has a pretty strong threat intelligence team, and uh, I've had chance to kind of learn more about uh, members of that team. And some of them have come from like being a translator, and then got uh, introduced to this whole landscape of threat intelligence or threat, uh, threat intelligence gathering and just jumped into it. So without any necessarily technical background. Um, so definitely would, would recommend uh, looking into that. And I might, if I may add, um, I did come from, you know, before I moved to the US um, from Ethiopia, I, st I did study uh, law, I had a law degree, but um, 
I, I wouldn't say that it has sparked anything into cybersecurity. I had no idea about cybersecurity or computers really, but, but I would say, you know, the analytical skills that are needed in cybersecurity, they can be, there are a lot of transferable skills that come from. So you might already have the skills that you need to work into certain aspects of cybersecurity. I'm sure there is a cybersecurity lawyer. And then also the one thing that came up to me was um, digital forensics space can be related to that. So I just want to mention those two topics. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I I, I uh, wanted to add ahead. a few things. Um, well, a thing to it. Uh, I was working with the past two years. I've, I've worked with uh, some cyber patriot summer camps, right? And this idea of like, how do you communicate like roles in cybersecurity through like a like a comparison that kids might understand a little bit better. Um, and I made comparisons between uh, infosec jobs and you know law enforcement, as well as infosec and like sports, right? Because a lot of kids want to be a sport, uh, want to be want to be an athlete, right? But not everyone can be the the star quarterback. So, um, for what it's worth, right? Some of the comparisons that I made was, you know, if you're if you're a nine one one operator, that might be similar to something like a SOC analyst, right? You're looking at a lot of different inputs, you're making intelligent decisions around how best to respond, directing resources. Um, you know, if you work in a, in a CSI lab, right, if they understand the CSI <laughs> show reference, uh, that might lend, lend itself towards digital forensics, as, as Zanette was just saying. Um, you know, if you were a detective or a PI, you might be a, a pen tester or a threat hunter, or maybe an auditor. If you were part of a SWAT team, you know, you could be a network defender. If you were, you know, a, a fire person, uh, EMT, medic, uh, maybe incident response or incident handling. If you are a police chief, you know, a team leader generally, right, where you understand the skills of people, you know, how to deploy assets. And so it, it's hopefully a way to start um, thinking about reframing your skill set within a cybersecurity context. And, and there were a couple of other uh, questions, I think, in the chat that popped up around like, hey, I've got this experience. How do I, I break into um, you know, a, a job in cybersecurity. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, understanding the role that you're looking at and then finding those those salient experiences that that are, are practical. Um, I have a couple of examples, if you all will indulge me. Um, maybe you're a system administrator and you're just very diligent about access controls, right? <laughs> um, if you're, you know, a network admin, you're, you're very diligent about uh, properly configured firewalls. If you're an application developer, right, thinking about secure coding best practices, right, what are the, the security minded things that you do in your role that are part of your job description, but not necessarily the central focus. Um, if you come from marketing, especially digital marketing, right, uh, you're looking at Google Analytics and it's kind of like a, a, a seam, right? Um, where you're you're having to understand event logs and understand traffic and you know follow queries to their natural conclusion um, that lends itself a little bit and then from the other side the creative marketing side maybe uh, security awareness right understanding psychology and how people think and how messages become really salient and and sticky for them so um, it, it's not a one to one answering everyone's question in the chat but thinking about what are those skills that you have. What are the types of jobs you're looking for in this broad umbrella of cybersecurity? And then having uh, you know, really clear messages around how your skills dovetail with those requirements. There's a little bit of chat um, about being technical or not being technical. Um, and I think uh, like, like all labels, it's, it's a little dangerous to use that as a, as a label. Um, I'll frequently call myself non-technical, but I think I really, really am. So. <laughs> <laughs> but compared to my mom or my kids, um, they think I know what I'm doing. Um, but I'll even hear people that have worked um, sort of in the, in the or along the fringes of, of being like deeply technical, and they think of themselves as not technical at all when, when they're the person you call when, when, when you need help, and they still don't think that um, they have any skills. So um, Sunil or Anthony, anybody want to... PJ or Zanette, anybody want to jump in on um, that sort of those misperceptions about what it means to be technical? 
I, I can go first. And I, I think like it's not about technical or non-technical. It's about being practitioner and not being in practitioner, right? Uh, and that that kind of different that is very different, right? I, I may not be technical, but if I understand the concept, if I can take my critical thinking and problem solving skills and apply to solve a problem. I I am with you, Lisa. I think I'm technical, right? Because I can I can understand what the problem we are solving and what is the path to solve that problem. I can break down and and kind of lay the path for the technical folks <laughs> to go solve it, right? Uh, so I would think about it that way, right? Don't let that stop you from kind of getting getting an entry into this career. Uh, get out of that mindset. Yeah, and 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 to piggyback on that, I think uh, you know for me. I, I sort of fall into this fallacy too, where it's like, I might consider myself non-technical because I don't feel comfortable like in a command terminal writing lines of script, but I understand the lingo. I understand the business impact. I can communicate that, you know, between the appropriate audiences. And, and I think that the general public, you know, would, would think that, um, you know, maybe one of these other misconceptions is like, you know, the hooded hacker in a basement who's trying to pwn, you know, critical infrastructure from a, a, a nation state, right? Like that's a cyber criminal. That's, <laughs> uh, you know, we need to call that what it is and maybe move away from that stereotype of like that being, um, and I think we're getting better, but like that can be a stereotype of, of what cybersecurity is. And so maybe shifting that mindset to say, um, you know, maybe a quote unquote non-technical is that that policy uh, or, or global compliance and risk or that that audit um, risk management type where you understand and you can have conversations around, you know, security related topics. You might not necessarily be the hands on keyboard practitioner. Um, and, and then maybe that shift in mindset can start to think about, you know, this again, like this technical versus non-technical, right? If, if we're constantly showing you know, pen testers and social and uh, social engineers like breaking into banks to like you know leave a calling card. Um, that's an elite skill set, right? And so if we're if we're exclusively holding up elite skill sets as like the, the the summary of what it is to be in the infosec industry, I think a lot of people self select out because they say I don't have that, I can't get into it. Um, we're really looking at at a spectrum from entry level to expert level across these you know hands on keyboard technician. Um, technician type roles versus like the, the more managerial uh, policy oriented roles. And, and I think that, you know, by breaking that down and we're all going to have our, our own biases on a continual basis. But, um, you know, if, if you're able to track the conversation that we've had today, I would probably say you're, you're a technical person. <laughs> you're technical enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would say there's a few people that have brought up in the chat uh, points around, you um, you know, those bad job descriptions and how do you sort of get beyond HR to even get to the hiring manager? Um, you know, oftentimes it's hard to find out who the hiring manager is. But in the meantime, I, you know, I don't know any security people complain all the time about being hit up by salespeople on LinkedIn. I've never heard anybody complain about being hit up on LinkedIn by somebody who's trying to break into the field. Um, there are a lot of folks out there that are ready to be mentors. Um, and are willing to have a discussion with you. I have seen some um, advocates in the field, just chief security officers and other leaders who will uh, post a bio about somebody that they're working with who's entering the field, um, post their, their LinkedIn profile or their resume out there to say, hey, can we help this person? And there, there really is a super active uh, security community on LinkedIn. So I think that um, Anthony put some of those names in the, in the chat don't be afraid to reach out and just say, hey, I'm trying to get in the field. You know, you know, you, if they won't link to you, follow them. Um, there, it really is all about people at the end of the day. Uh, and there's a lot of algorithms that are, that are um, weeding through our resumes these days. So it can be hard to, to break through um, to get to the actual hiring manager. Um, so in the absence of being, to, being able to network at live events, um, a lot of uh, a lot of folks are are networking like crazy on LinkedIn. So that did you have another resource that you wanted to add? Um, I might have added cybersec.org. I like that one. I usually share that. It's a it's sort of an interactive um, site where it shows you, you know, if you're coming from any type of role that you know from entry to intermediate and advanced level where you potentially could go. For example, if you're coming from a software development position how you can be, you know, entering, like it's so interactive, it would show you, you know, what state, how many open positions exist. And then 
um, how would you go about achieving those positions, including, you know, the, the, the salary and all of those things. I like that side. I like to recommend that to people to explore that. But I want to add also like that um, technical and technical aspect. It does have like some sort of gender stereotype as well. I, I have seen that I, at one point I interviewed for a, a position for promotion and, um, you know, I was told, you know, regardless of the reasoning, um, you know, we needed a more technical person. And I was telling myself, and this is what I would say, like, be an advocate for yourself more than anything, because you have to question, like I, I told myself, you know, I am doing a graduate school at Georgia Tech University. I have all of this certification. At one point, would you consider a woman to become technical? Like, that was the reason for me in deciding, you know, should I interview again for that position when it was reposted or should I leave that space completely? And then I stayed, I re-interviewed and I got that promotion again. So I would say, you know, be an advocate for yourself. And there are a lot of stereotypical things within the industry, specifically, you know, gender wise. So I just want to say that before I end it. Plow through would be my, my advice. And I think PJ's too, just, just keep going, just keep moving. Um, thank you very much. I want to thank all the panelists today. This was a super lively discussion and I hope really valuable for our audience. Um, thank you, Palo Alto Networks for sponsoring. And um, if you want to follow us, we, I invite you to do that, or you can sign up for our newsletter on staysafeonline.org. That way you can stay abreast of um, upcoming events like this and other resources that we're adding to that, um, to that education resource page. Thank you very much for attending today.